Any questions about any of that? Our next question asks, how has sexual behavior changed in the past 50 years? And we begin with talking about attitudes about premarital sex. We do this by conducting probability samples. The method of drawing a sample of survey from the U.S. population that ensures that everyone has an equal probability of being in the sample. So we're trying to come up with representative samples that are somewhat small in size so we can study them, but that matches the makeup of the people of the state as a whole. When we do this, we see that among people coming into adulthood after the 60s, 90% or more had some form of premarital sex. Of the evangelical and fundamentalist Christian populations, these are the most conservative of the Protestants, and they're teaching against this. Um, studies among these particular religious groups actually show youth from these religious denominations don't actually start sex later, and are not more likely to wait for marriage than members of other religious groups. So if the religious message itself doesn't change behavior, what does? What they're saying is that it doesn't really matter if you're from a very sort of open uh, religion whose teachings about sex or from a very, very conservative religion that has very, very uh, strict teachings about sex. We don't actually see that make a difference in how long people wait to have sex or if they wait until marriage or not. What does make a difference, do you think, if the particular message doesn't? To a certain extent. I mean, what, uh, the one thing that we've been able to dial in on is how religious someone is. The more they, um, I don't want to say believe in the faith, but the stronger their faith is, and the closer ties they have to that religious community makes a difference. We have this particular study. Um, a is another one that uses the heck out of me, so I'm going to try to ask the question here and see if you all will answer the same way. It's a study that looked at the attitudes of parents that compared American and Dutch parents. Dutch being the Netherlands. They asked parents of 16-year-olds in both nations how they would feel if their son or daughter wanted their girlfriend or boyfriend to sleep overnight in the family's home. How do you think the American parents answered that question? If you have a 16-year-old son, he wants his girlfriend to stay overnight with him in your house. If you have a 16-year-old daughter, she wants her boyfriend to spend the night with her overnight in your house. How do Americans answer that? I would have been locked out of the house. I am almost 20, and my mom just now let me be alone with my boyfriend at home, like when she's not home. Okay. So I was pregnant with my first one, I still couldn't stay the night in my boyfriend's house. I don't want to love my boyfriend, so it is, it can stay in the basement. Okay. It's kind of how it was with my brothers. Like, they were like, you know, you can have your girlfriend over for the night, but she has to stay out on the couch, you know? Because <laughs> I can hang out until 10 o'clock. And did the parents sort of set up camp between the couch and bedroom to make sure there was Pretty no walking back and forth? Pretty much, I do a little sleep underneath the couch. For, for the couch. Right. <laughs> my brother would often end up on the couch with her, and then wake up so deep sleepers or okay. <laughs> so from kind of all that overall how do you think American parents answered this are they okay with this situation no yep. Americans in general said over my dead body would this happen. No way, uh-uh, not happening. They express concerns that kids who have sex are driven by raging hormones and aren't thinking clearly. They're not making rational decisions. Teen sex is the outcome of the battle of the sexes, meaning all boys want some and all girls are fighting to keep the boys from getting it. And it's the girls eventually giving in to the boys. And even if they knew sex was common, and their own child might be doing it, it's like a la, 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 I can't hear you, I can't see you approach. Because they thought, I don't care if it's, hap if it, if it's happening, I'll be damned if it's happening in my house. So they could go out and do it in the car under the bridge somewhere, but I'm not going to let it happen in my house. Hey, that was the American response. 
How do you think Dutch parents reacted? Same way, similar way, different way? What do you think? Yes, sir. Okay. So by opposite, she said, if they're in my house, at least I know they're not doing it. But everyone that said opposite, what do you mean by opposite? The child would rather take them out. A lot of parents who say, you know, I'll watch your alcohol my child. They know it's going to happen. You have a nurse provision. That's okay. Okay. Dutch parents in general, by and large, were okay with this. They thought that sex should be in a relationship with a nice person. They saw sex as a natural and appropriate progression of a relationship. They preferred that if their teen child was going to have sex, they wanted them to have it at home in a clean, comfortable place and not under the bridge or in the back of the car somewhere. And they wanted the opportunity to talk to their child about having sex, to make sure they were using protection from sexually transmitted diseases and pregnancies. So, totally different results. One, ah, hell no. One, yeah, okay, whatever. What do you think accounts for this difference in opinion? Hmm? But what about the cultures, maybe? And so... If the Dutch do sex differently, then why do you think what accounts for that difference in view? There is one thing we can actually trace this back to. One major difference. And it's actually a major difference that we can use to look state by state in this country to see how people think about sex and even tie it into the levels of STD infection and teen pregnancy. You know what that is? The one thing that we can, for sure, in research that totally makes a difference. That is sex education. Yes. How, when it comes to sex education, and I'm going to ask you this question, what can you do should we be offering comprehensive programs that offer information about uh, condoms, about birth control, about homosexuality, about all these things? Okay. Should it be abstinence only, as in the don't do it? Or should it be a mix of the two, where abstinence, yes, is the only 100% surefire way to not catch anything, but if you do it, here's the information you need. My next question then is, where should these conversations or lessons take place? With the parents, in the school, or maybe even the church? All of it. It takes place everywhere. Okay. It used to be in the schools because, although it should be at home, the parents should be doing it, a lot of parents shy away from those conversations. Okay. So, you know, they're trying to know, they're on the school bus. Okay, what about the parents that say, no way in hell are you keeping my child anything about sex in school. I'm going to pull them out of it. Should we allow parents to do that? Are the rights of the parents to say, yes, my kids should know about this, or no, my kids should not know about this, more important than, say, society's interest in controlling teen pregnancy and STDs? I think it should be conflict of parents' decision. If they want to be the ones to discuss it with their child, then yes. There are certain conversations I want to have with my child that I don't want to have. Okay. Here's what I mean by saying that we can trace it back to this issue. This is the current state of sex education in the United States. 
If the state is in red, that means it is mandated by law that these schools teach sex ed in that state. No shading means it's up to the state or local school board if they want to provide sex ed or not. Those slash colors are where if you provide sex education in this state, it must be medically accurate. Notice there are states that require sex education, but don't require it to be medically accurate. And then there are all of the states that are kind of a free for all and whatever the hell you want to do. So that means sometimes the programs we get are the variety of don't do it. Because if you do it, you'll get pregnant and die. You'll get pregnant and die. <laughs> or condoms don't work. So even if you use condoms, you'll get pregnant and die. <laughs> or birth control causes cancer, birth control will make you sterile, all that sort of stuff. These programs actually exist that are far more focused on scaring the crap out of kids than anything else. And what we find is that, yes, some kids are going to take the just don't do it or don't do it until marriage message to heart, depending on their family background, their environment, all that sort of stuff. But the truth is, is not all teens are going to do this. And if they're in an education program that tells them condoms don't work, birth control will kill you, all that sort of stuff, they don't use any of this stuff when they have sex. And so, I'm looking at you, Tennessee. <laughs> teen pregnancy rates and STD infections among teens skyrocket. Tennessee. <laughs> also a state that requires sex education, but doesn't have to be medically accurate. Last thing before I let you go, um, this is another video from BuzzFeed that I actually just found last night, but it seemed too perfect to not include in this little bit about sex ed. This is what driver's ed would look like if we taught our teens to drive in the same way we teach them about sex. Oh, wow. <laughs> Come on. Get inside of an engine. It may not be as sexy, as some of the uh, car pictures you see in your dad's car magazines, let's drive it. Let's drive it right there. Alright, there's one thing I want you guys to take away from driving with that. It's don't drive. If you have to drive, wear a seatbelt. But don't drive. So how does driver's head going at school? It's fine. Too many questions? Or... You really don't want to talk about this. Okay, and don't forget, when you drive with somebody, it's like driving with everyone they've ever driven with. You drive with some guy, you drive with all the girls he drove with. I want you to know, buddy, be selective. You only need one car, really. So you've only ever driven one car? Can we're talking about you now, not me. Yes. Can two boys drive together? Mm, nope. You have no idea that that's what it looked like on the inside. Should we be looking at this? Ooh. It's gross. You get yourself into a wreck. You have a bus suspender for the rest of your life. No one's going to want to drive with you. You know, God wants you to wait to drive. I don't know how that can be true. Jesus never drove, so I don't know why you need to. What do you do if your carburetor breaks down? Yeah, you know that. I don't want to wait to drive, because I don't want to get to college and find out I'm a bad driver. You know, I wish my dad would talk to me about this, but he didn't. I, uh, I had to learn this in the streets on my own. Um, <laughs> Talk about in the same youth. Can't I just like drive for fun? Because I know it's really fun. No, driving is only to get you where you need to go. There are plenty of good alternatives to driving, like walking, biking fun. What about what we're going to You know, I uh, wanted Mr. Stevens to come in here today and talk to the girls, but uh, she wasn't available. So I'm going to have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Alvin, what is this? They gave it to us in driver's ed. This is just encouraging me to drive. Everybody take one pamphlet, take them home, read them. That was a good one? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't see it. Why is the gym teacher teaching us how to drive? I don't know. But he hasn't driven in years. What a drive. Fast? But sometimes slow to enjoy the day. Ah, yes, we're going to have a little bit of this chapter on Tuesday and then start to figure this out. And the whole point of that 
was to talk about the state of sexual education in this country, how it's kind of a patchwork of laws and rules. It's not really consistent across the board. And a lot of the sex education that we get isn't always medically accurate. So to follow up on that brief discussion, I want to ask you all, first of all, in the ideal world, where should these conversations about sexual education happen? Is it the job of the parents? Should it happen at school or the church or somewhere else? I'll leave that. Okay. Your parents? It should start with the parents and then it should, like, that way when the child goes to school, you know, when they learn about it at school, it's, it's something that they already kind of know a little bit about. And then that way, with the school teaches them, maybe a little more reinforcement. Okay. I don't really know how much a church should really teach that kind of stuff. <coughs> Only because when you think about church, I mean, I understand saying, you know, no sex before marriage because of the sin, and I get that, but I don't really think they should teach sex education. Quick one, who wants to go first? <laughs> I mean, a church is such an influential part of a child's life that, you know, if they're really into it, that they could gain a lot from that, understanding the spiritual parts of sex, and that you're not just taking your toes off and start to wow, it's not like that, it's that there's spiritual meaning to it. I think that gives children a lot better incentive not to have sex, just have a school. Okay, and I was just being sassy for sure. He's just being a smart ass. ass. Okay. Uh, I mean, I hear what you're saying. I just, I kind of feel like maybe at a certain age it could be in church, but I mean, as early as they're starting it in schools now, I don't think children should be taught that at church. I just don't. Why? Just like, I don't know, okay, for me, fifth grade it was my first sex ed class in California. I didn't, I mean, I didn't understand it. And then, like, if I go to church and they're telling me about this spirit, I'm 19 years old. I mean, that's not something that I'm, I'm thinking about. That's not so something I'm going to understand. So, when you go to school, these 19-year-olds are just like prostitutes. It's the same thing. They're just getting a skewed idea. Of it. We teach them sex just right away and teach them, this, like, what it means and how it's supposed to be and that you don't dress like a skank. I think that's a lot better lesson to learn than going to school and seeing all these kids your own age dressing like prostitutes. Yeah. Like them too. Well, in that aspect, and yeah, I understand that. But it's, it's, it's just kind of a touchy subject to discuss with certain age groups for me. It just, it really is. I mean, I understand the aspect of teaching them, yeah, we don't dress like this. This is, you know, not good. I get that. But just certain parts of it, I don't think needs to be taught. I think the earlier we start teaching it, the, the better understanding they have of it. It's like, it's kind of like drinking. There's mm-hmm. not nearly as You've got to be careful about how early you start teaching it, though, because there's the potential there to actually scar some kids. Yeah, and then I was thinking, too, even though the church, if they taught it, you know, what about some of those kids out there that, you know, as they get older and they're taught this specific way, what if they're gay or they're lesbian or they're not? I mean, they're going to feel like that. Like, you you can't be like, well, it's not okay to be gay. Like, of course. Well, it's cool, yeah. So, like, in our example video here, when she asked, can two boys drive together? He said, no. So there should be more than that. Yeah, it's just, just church isn't going to teach it like that. It's not. Yeah. It depends on the church, honestly. I have never been to a church in all my 23 years of life that has ever been gentle or nice about being gay or lesbian. It's always like been a Unitarian, fact. Anglican. That's what I was about to uh, say. <laughs> Even the Methodists are, the Methodists are coming around. Yep. Yeah. I guess they don't get to get up with church. Didn't you grow up Pentecostal? Southern Pentecostal. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and Catholic. That, that was a whole like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And that's what we are, and it's like, they're kind of uh, it, It's they're really harsh. harsh. It really is. Like, my grandmother, she's Mormon. Like, my mom's mom is Mormon. My dad's mom was Southern Pentecostal. And somewhere in the whole aspect, I got put in Catholic school. So, so you're all kinds of confused. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> It was really hard because, like for me, when I turned when I turned 15 and I told everybody that I was not 
completely straight and that I was into women, I thought my family was going to disown me. Like, nobody in my family spoke to me for, like, three weeks. I did not exist to anybody for three weeks, which shocked me because my mom's older brother is, was full-fledged gay. Like, he told you, I'm gay. That's my boyfriend. Get over it. But, like, nobody talked to me for, like, three weeks. And I felt very, like, oh, no. <laughs> See, you've just been to some crazy churches. We <laughs> <laughs> aren't that bad. And I know it was really hard for me, too. I don't feel like I've been shunned out of church for my views on it or my sexuality, regardless. Yeah, I had my church, as harsh as they are, there was a girl that the preacher's daughter, she was lesbian for a while. I mean, the programs they do have tend to be funded by fairly conservative organizations. And you'll notice here, I haven't really pointed it out, but this note at the bottom was that California and Louisiana are the only two states that forbid the promotion of religion in sex ed classes. So in a lot of places, you'll have religiously funded sex education in the public school. And Tennessee tends to be one of those states. Tennessee is also a state that got really, really close, as we're talking about it, really, really close to passing what uh, a lot of people call the Don't Say Gay Bill, which essentially made it a crime for a public school teacher to say anything about homosexuality in front of children under the age of 18. Like, you would be prosecuted and sent to jail for saying something like gay is okay. To the point that if a gay kid in your school was being beaten up or harassed and you intervened and told them it'll be okay, you're technically committing a crime because you're promoting homosexuality. Um, it didn't pass, but it got pretty close. That would have been terrible. Yeah, they're pretty mean about it, there. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, we, uh, I don't have, I could certainly look and look and bring them in if you're interested. I don't have the actual statistics, so, but generally, places that have certain types of sex education, these things skyrocket. Which leads me to my next question. What type of programs should we be offering? So we talked about where, what type of programs should they be? Should they be comprehensive programs that include information about abstinence, but also everything else? Or should we be promoting abstinence only programs? No, they should be everything. Yeah, they should be like, well, the only way to not get SD or pregnant is to be not have sex, but if you do, this is like how to protect yourself and like educate them about it. Okay. And it should be all age appropriate. That's something that um, I think is skewed a little bit when they're teaching sex ed because like in sixth grade, you really don't need to watch certain videos. Well, well, and again, that's, that's a debatable thing, because we, we throw that term around age-appropriate all the time. You know, what exactly is sense. age appropriate? And there you go. That was going to be my point. My, <laughs> my sister was sixth grade when she lost her virginity. Oh, my gosh. And I about beat the crap out of her. And so that begs the question of what is age-appropriate? If you say, well, we don't want to start talking to them until maybe 14, the well, unfortunate okay. truth is there is a simple population. Hey, when I say age-appropriate, I mean, like, in sixth grade, you don't really need to watch a video of a woman having a baby. Oh, I did that. Oh, really? Because I think that's really important. Yeah. <laughs> I think that is. Like, you want to? Say it. Say it. Yeah. So I, don't, I don't even show that video of my human growth and development classes in college. Yeah, I, have, I can look CGI version that, that illustrates it. My well, that in, in high school. My well, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. You don't need to watch an actual, I mean, maybe like, like you said, one of those little simulations of, you know, that. That would be I more age appropriate. It's just like, no, 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 scare the hell out of me. <laughs> exactly. When I was 10, my mom had my little brother. She made me go into the delivery room with her. No, I was like, <laughs> not going to happen. That's disgusting. Uh, I can't sort cite this source. Sort this thing. <laughs> You've been listening to me teach for too long. <laughs> Yeah, the average uh, age uh, of girls losing their virginity is 12 in America. Yeah, I've seen that. I wouldn't doubt it. I didn't even watch it. This is what it does, the average. Um, and I don't want to be that guy who quotes Family Guy. Right. But uh, there was an episode where they did an abstinence only program and everyone started having ear sex. <laughs> yes, I remember that one. It's a goofy way to say it, but I think there's a point to that. Uh, there's so much misinformation out there. 
Yeah. And if we just say don't do it, they say, well, if we don't do it that way, it's not really sex. Right, and they don't really agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's a valid point. Um, I'm going to disclaim what I'm about to say with, I've read news and research articles about this. I haven't actually seen it myself. But one of the other issues that they've been raising, specifically on sexuality forums, and by sexuality forums, I'm talking about professionals in like the ASA and APA that research this stuff, is since the invention of white cams, we've seen something else that sites like Omegle for one, Cam4, you know, where people sort of get there, either chat with random people online or do the whole, like, hey, I'm in front of my webcam, everyone come watch me. Something that has been popping up on a lot of these sites is that some of the performers are getting younger and younger and younger to the point that, that law enforcement has actually had some issues with like eight, nine, and ten year olds on the webcam, you know, doing stuff for people. And again, I have no idea how prevalent that is because who the hell is going to do that kind of study? But it's happened enough that it's, it's showing up in some law enforcement and some uh, sexuality blogs. So yeah, what is age appropriate education? is a relevant question. Um, do you think, and we talked a little bit about should the parents be having these conversations, should it be at school or wherever. Do you think there's at any point in time where the parents' rights to determine what, they'll ch what their children learns should end? And I mean that by saying even in places where sex ed is mandated, Parents still have the ability to say, nope, nope, my kids aren't sitting through that, and I'm pulling them out of it. Is there at any point, do you think, that we have to say, well, no, sorry, this is important enough that your kids have to know it, and you can't bring that, or the parents' rights always care now? I think that's a parent's decision. I mean, yeah. it's not designed for sex ed to go off their kids' parents or something like that. Yeah. Well, like at my school, the, the, we, had, we didn't have, like, Like whether you have to have like parents' permission. You want to they're like, well, if you want to take this, you have to ask for having signed a paper and like that. Mm -hmm. okay. My mom was like, Yeah, go go take it. Go. I don't want to have that conversation. Yeah, we did. That's another thing. Your parents the parents should be able like feel not be like my mom. She was like, I'm not talking to you, find out other places and I'm like, Okay. <laughs> Okay, let me go yeah, out to the park and see what's happening yeah. about maybe. I think, I think of course, you know, I'm, I'm one of those that the internet wasn't really a thing until I was like in junior high or high school. And so I guess my generation is kind of the cutoff of, of if you didn't get it from your parents or, or from school, you kind of had to get invented to find your information. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel like too, that's part of the reason why parents don't want kids to take sex ed is because they're misinformed about it and they don't like they don't have all the information about what it is. What I'm specifically talking about here and usually what we hear about this is like the very end of that driver's ed clip where she brings up the seatbelt and she says what is this and she, the kid says oh they handed those out in driver's ed and she says they're just encouraging you to drive that's the reaction we usually get against sex education programs, is if we have it, it's going to encourage the kids to have sex. So my kids aren't sitting through that. That's the reaction we usually get, and why opt-out programs exist, usually because the people you're screaming about it are the ones, no, 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 you're not teaching that to my kids because I just encourage them. That's like saying birth control encourages people to have sex. Oh, that argument is very prevalent and out there, too. So that's kind of my point with this part of the question. Is there at any point in time where we say, you know what, teen pregnancy and STD transmission is a problem and it's something that we need to control? Is that interest of keeping teens from being pregnant and controlling the transmission of sexually transmitted diseases, is that important enough to say to parents, I'm sorry, we're going to teach your kids this regardless of what you think? I know that it's Right now in America, especially in other countries, how many like unplanned teen pregnancies we have. 
right? We are number one in something. Okay. We're always number one. The reason on that side of the debate, why there is the push for it, is because in overall statistical trends, and again I'm talking about in general and on a large scale, we can tell a massive difference in the numbers at, in areas where kids do get comprehensive sex education. And I'm not talking about a little bit, I'm talking about a massive, massive difference. How many parents would actually sort of keep their kids out of these programs is debatable. It's just an argument out there because, as usual, when it comes to a controversial type topic, you hear the loud, not necessarily the majority, if that makes sense. So it could just be a very vocal minority, and it could be a new point. But it's a question I ask anyway because the argument's out there. Um, I think that's all I was going to ask. Okay. That'll be one of your short answer options on the next quiz, to sort of go through and discuss what you think and why. Um, okay. So then we move on to the last part of this chapter. Which predilection number is that? Yeah. While, pre while premarital sex has become a fairly universal concept, the numbers overall have declined slightly since the 80s. Excuse me. And the context in which it happens has changed. When we mean, when we say that it has declined since the 80s, what we mean is that the overall trend of the age that teenagers start to have sex, or the number of teens that have had sex by a certain age, has been declining slightly. <coughs> the changing context is that even in the 1950s, premarital sex was somewhat common. We talked about the other day about how Kinsey's research on sexuality shocked 1950s America because our picture of 1950s America was, you know, suburbia with the white picket fence and mom and dad and everything else. Premarital sex was fairly common back then. But if you were having premarital sex in the 50s, it was generally with the person that you were going to be married to. Like you had already kind of coupled up and dating for a while, you were planning to get married and you were like, well, you know, who's going to know? And so you kind of engaged in sex before marriage, but it was with the person you were eventually going to get married to. In the 70s, of course, the so-called sexual revolution and everything else was going, that was going on, we see the rise in cohabitation, which is the act of living together as an unmarried couple. And it is only somewhat recently that we have the context of the casual hookup, which is the sort of casual sexual encounter with no actual intention of commitment. This chart is from your book, and it's a study about how far college students went sexually on their most recent hookup, about 35% going as far as to kiss, 12% to hand to genital stimulation, 12% went to oral sex, and then a full 40% went full on intercourse and their most recent hookup. Even in all this stuff that we've been talking about with the sexual revolution and the gender revolution and all that sort of stuff, we do, do still see some inequalities gender-wise in sexual relationships. And again, here's the argument that we were just talking about, that the availability of birth control has had a huge impact on this area. It has made it a little bit easier for people to make more well-reasoned, well-planned sexual decisions. Because the reality is, before birth control, the full responsibility, I guess, kind of fell on the guy, because we had condoms, but no birth control. And women had diaphragms, but diaphragms have always been kind of a clunky, unwieldy thing to, to use effectively. But it was always kind of on the guy. What birth control did do is let women have a little bit more control. Because if you were a young woman in high school, maybe getting ready to go to college before birth control, and you were sexually active, what potential consequence did you have to deal with that men really didn't? 
Yeah. Women are the ones that actually get pregnant. And so, you know, it was much more common for women to either have to delay education or delay starting a career if they were sexually active because they had a much higher chance of getting pregnant. Now, well, birth control in and of itself has its own set of issues and isn't always 100% effective depending upon how you use it and everything else that's going on with you. It has changed things slightly. It overall gives women a little bit more control and the opportunity to sort of still be sexually active if they want to, but to delay childbirth a little bit later in life. We've talked about um, the field of employment has changed quite a bit with women gaining more equality there, but there still is sort of a gender disparity in dating and sexual relationships. Namely, culturally, who do we still expect to make the first move sexually and the first sort of overture to, hey, you want to go out? Yeah. You really expect the man to do that. What is the general perception of a woman that does that? A little, yeah, a little too forward, maybe. What else? A hoochie? Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, some times, maybe it's refreshing, but yeah, generally the overall cultural perception is that's a little weird. And even when we go so far as to study sexual satisfaction, we do see a difference between men and women. The one thing we do have in common is that overall, by and large, both men and women say that they experience better sex and better satisfaction with sex in long-term relationships rather than the casual hookup. <clears throat> but what we do see is that men report caring more about the pleasure of their long-term partner either a long-time girlfriend or their wives, then they do the casual hookup. Men are kind of selfish with the casual hookup. It's all about me. If she enjoys it, that's a bonus, but I don't really care. Women, however, feel pressured to put their partner's pleasure first in both settings, both the long-term relationship and the casual hookup. I will leave it to yourself to sort of speculate as to why that may be. There are a couple of reasons that I can probably think of off the top of my head. But that is what we find. Men tend to be really selfish in hookups, care about long-term partners. Women kind of care about the other partner in, in both settings. All right. Any overall questions about any of that data, et cetera, et cetera, or the whole chapter? Because that is the end of this chapter.